Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Everybody can hear me okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a great lineup today. I want to thank Dr. Kowalczyk from radiology, and I want to thank the radiology department for supporting this multidisciplinary event. We also have Dr. Diaz from vascular surgery, and I want to send a big thanks out to vascular surgery. Hopefully, make it a little bit more exciting, not just one person up here um, yapping all the time. So here is our agenda. Uh, introduction and scope, then we're going to be followed by radiology with some nuances and pearls for diagnostics, then vascular is going to give a spiel, and then I'm going to try to, if there's time, I'm going to wrap it up with a very convincing argument, uh, actually, uh, you know, an intervention that guarantees uh, no more recurrence, improved glycemic control, no complications from a PICC line, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But first, I have an important public service announcement, a very important announcement. We're heading in the wrong direction. After going to national venues and, um, you know, and touting our success on our great CLABSI, on our great CAUTI reduction, right, in the first couple of months of this quarter, that blue line, um, that's only the last year, but it's, it's getting worse. And that's the standardized infection ratio. That just means the number of CAUTIs standardized across all like hospitals, so we can compare this hospital to that hospital. It's getting worse. I, normally, I could argue that we're doing so good at reducing what goes into the denominator, in other words, the device days, the number of days that patients have devices in them. So if you, if you reduce the denominator, you can mask the effect of a good, successful intervention. But the reason why this is a problem, and I'm taking one minute to do it, is because I can't even argue that. The bigger problem, in my opinion, is that our device days are going up. Our utilization rate is going up. And so, with that in mind, I just want to ask you guys, culture judiciously, urine cultures, get the Foley out and come to our uh, system-wide healthcare-associated uh, infection meeting. We're going to make this into a, a m and M, if you will, because monthly, the infection preventionists and I and all the group of the representative nurses, we meet and we go over these cases, but we would like more representation from the physician group, especially the hospitals, because what we're doing is, it's just me and the, the people I mentioned, we're sitting around and we're looking at it, we're trying to understand, why did the provider have this Foley in for 40 days? That's the one we just used. Why did somebody send a urine culture two days before somebody's going on hospice? Okay, and there's another one. So two patients account, so we review each of those cases, but I'm sure there's good reasons for why providers do that, and that's why I want to invite you to come to that meeting. Okay, so without any further ado, and I'll, I'll send, Carlos will send out uh, to representatives, and I'll meet personally, and I'll try to get some representatives from the hospitalists and the APPs. So why are we talking about diabetic foot ulcers? I'm sure nobody has seen a diabetic foot ulcer here in the last week or so, right? So 60% of the global population with diabetes have foot, 6.3. Annually, about 10 to 26 million patients with diabetes will develop uh, foot ulcers in the, worldwide. About a third patients with diabetes will develop an ulcer in their lifetime, fully a third. The risk of death if you have a foot ulcer uh, compared to a person that's matched and doesn't have a foot ulcer with diabetes is five times higher. Almost one in five patients with diabetes in a foot ulcer will require eventual amputation. The five-year mortality, if you have diabetes plus an ulcer plus one amputation, is 70%, 70% at five years. And if you have a foot ulcer, a history of an amputation, and you need dialysis, you almost have a 75% mortality at two years. So that's why we're talking about it. So, no pun intended, but if I look at slicer dicer, and I just say, what are the top 10, unfiltered, what are the top 10 diagnoses in our area? So in the left, on your left, the big red bar there actually is all the patients in the healthcare system. Actually, there's a little more. Just the top 10, you see type 2 diabetes makes the top 10 without an unfiltered cut. And if you further dice it down, you can't really see, so I printed it out here. In the last six months, only in the last six months, almost 1,900 patients with diabetes were seen, and almost 1,200 had type 2 diabetes, almost 170 or so diabetes and a foot ulcer. There were 106 foot debridements and 32 lower extremity debridements. So that's the local data. Typical patient, type 2 diabetes, overweight, obese, high cholesterol, 
CKD, coronary artery disease, probably throw in some PAD there as well. Several rounds of oral antibiotics, maybe one or two rounds of IV antibiotics. Somebody gets a fairly decent surface swab, grows coag negative staph, carinibacteria bacteria, pseudomonas, enterococcus. The question is often, does this patient have osteomyelitis? Does this patient need antibiotics? Does this patient need a pick line with six weeks of antibiotics? And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kowalczyk, and he'll talk about some uh, nuances of imaging. All right, well, thank you for inviting me. Does this work? Yep. Does that work better? Does it work at all? Oh. Put the glasses. All right, how about that? Oh, that works better. All right. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, and uh, uh, my name is uh, Roman Kowalczyk. I'm the chief of musculoskeletal imaging for the section. And uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit in about five minutes uh, about imaging of osteomyelitis. Um, and obviously, I could give a three hour talk on this, but we're just going to try to get you some essentials uh, from your clinical perspective. Unfortunately, no disclosures. Um, all right. So, as for all imaging studies, the history is really important, and a lot of times you guys are in a hurry, you're just pulling down some drop down, you, you just, you're, you're moving quickly, um, but giving us some extra history is really, really important. So are there some predisposing factors? In this case, we're talking about diabetes mellitus, obviously that would be uh, very helpful information. And then there are some other clues that we can use, especially in questionable cases, so that we can come down and really say yes or no, because that's, that's what you want. You don't want an equivocal answer uh, if, if we can avoid giving you that. So is there a nearby ulcer? That's very, very helpful. Um, what's the location of that ulcer? So diabetic foot ulcer is, is not bad, but, but where? Is it at the distal first metatarsal, distal fifth metatarsal? Is it the heel? Uh, that's very helpful. How long has the ulcer been there? Um, if the ulcer has been there more than six months, that's an additional um, proven risk factor. What's the size of the ulcer? Now, generally, we can find it and we can see it, um, but it's nice to know what you see at the skin surface. Is there a positive probe? Can you get down to bone? That's a very, very uh, important factor for us. Then additional signs and symptoms, erythema, fever, white count, sed rate, cellulitis, draining abscess or tract. These are all helpful clues. Okay, so I don't expect that you're going to give us a yes-no checklist on every single one of these, but if several of these factors are sort of the obvious thing that you're looking for uh, and that you have, uh, give us the, those clues. Also, has the patient had recent surgery or fracture? Because those things can sometimes be confusing. I would argue that for the treatment of the patient at this moment, do everything you can to take your MRI first, for instance, and then your surgery second. If you did the surgery yesterday, or you did an aggressive debridement yesterday, it's gonna be very confusing. Now, that may serve as a new baseline for three months down the line, but it's gonna be very confusing in the immediate situation of what's happening to your patient. So for instance, draining diabetic ulcer, just a gray toe extending to bone, and that would be sort of a, a nice, nice clue for us. The ACR has the appropriateness criteria, um, has different scenarios. Um, this is just sort of one, one viewpoint. The MRI is gonna be your, your ultimate test. Um, it's going to have your highest sensitivity. It's going to have your highest specificity. So at the end of the day, uh, that's where you're going to go. We used to use IV contrast pretty much on every single case. Now we pretty much use IV contrast on almost no cases. Uh, and that's because of the whole thing with NSF. Uh, diabetics have renal problems. And, and rather than testing and making those uh, things more complicated, we've pretty much gone to no contrast uh, except maybe in young children. The reason mainly to use that is to just be sure that an abscess is not really a solid mass. Um, so basically, we don't do it now um, as a routine. So, so you can almost always just order MRI without uh, contrast. They have CT listed here. I wouldn't recommend CT uh, unless you really have uh, very limited options. The alternative, if you have um, contraindications to MRI, would be a three-phase bone scan with a white blood cell scan. Um, so I'm going to make a case that that's the alternative if you cannot get an MRI uh, for some reason. Uh, ultrasound is really not useful. Uh, CT with and without, there's no reason to do CT 
almost at all, let alone do it twice. So if you do it with and without, and that's why that's uh, at the bottom. So we always start with the radiographs, okay? I did say MRI is gonna be your ultimate test, and it will be, but start with the radiographs. And it should always be your first study. It answers some really, really simple questions. How many toes does the patient have? Okay, now that sounds funny, but a lot of these patients have had amputations, and it is very confusing. They've got contortions, they've got uh, deformities of some of their toes, and, and trying to slice through that it can be very confusing sometimes if you don't have the big picture. Hardware. Hardware obviously causes artifact pretty much on everything, um, but on radiographs, the, there really isn't much artifact other than you can't see through metal, okay? So uh, that's very important. And then a lot of radio opaque foreign bodies will be detected uh, on the x-ray, and, and it might be very difficult to figure out what it even is, but it might be obvious on x-rays. So on MRI, you might just see a big black void. Uh, so the x-rays are very helpful. Uh, as you probably know, x-rays have better spatial resolution than MRI, x-rays have better spatial resolution than bone scan, and x-rays have better spatial resolution than CT, okay? So they're really very valuable um, uh, in that respect. The reason we like the other ones is they're tomographic. So if you have things on top of each other in one plane, you can't see it very well. Um, but but x-rays are really very valuable. They are also the kings of calcium. Okay, so they can find little specks of calcium, bone spurs, bone matrix inside the bone, periosteal thickening, uh, these kinds of things. And, and they can be very confusing uh, on some of these other modalities. It's inexpensive, really cheap, easy to obtain, even if they're in the units or whatever. So, so just remember that this is what you want to order first, okay? <coughs> but let's suppose the x-rays are negative, okay? Then you're going to go to MRI. The, the most important sequence, and I'll show you a couple pictures here in a minute, uh, are the T1 sequence. So you want to see low T1 signal, and we need this for specificity, all right? Just about everything that's going to be low on T1 in this scenario is going to be high on T2, but if we call everything that's high on T2 osteomyelitis, we're going to overcall stuff, and, and we're going to really hurt your specificity. And then we're going to be looking for cellulitis, we're going to look for a nearby ulcer. We're going to look for an abscess. We're going to look for myositis uh, or pyomyositis. Uh, just parenthetically, pretty much every diabetic foot, the muscles will be abnormal. Um, and so for the most part, diabetic myopathy, I don't even mention in my reports because it gets people scared and confused. But, but pretty much if you have established diabetes, every single muscle in the foot is going to be abnormal. Um, and so we see predominantly fatty changes, but you can get extra... Uh, signal on T2-weighted imaging, and so if you're not aware of that, um, you might overcall that. So for the most part, I don't even mention that unless there's this pio part uh, where it looks like there's an abscess inside one of the muscles. Again, contrast, we pretty much never use this anymore. Where it would be helpful would be for an abscess if we wanted to confirm it's not a solid mass. Uh, sometimes you can see sinus tracts, or if you were really concerned particularly about what tissue might be devitalized, not infected, but devitalized. And then if at all possible, for the clinical scenario of this admission, this particular uh, patient episode, try to get the MRI before any surgery or uh, aggressive debridement. So MRI sagittal, this is the gray toe. So here is the, the distal phalanx, here's the proximal phalanx, metatarsal, and the cuneiform. So you see the normal cuneiform, normal metatarsal, nice white marrow signal on the T1-weighted image. On our fat-suppressed T2-weighted image, the marrow fat being fat suppressed uh, becomes dark. But if we look out here in the proximal phalanx, you start seeing some edema, and you have low T1 signal here. And in the distal phalanx, it's even more obvious. So this is really flagrant here, um, but this is osteomyelitis as well of the proximal uh, and distal phalanx, um, but sparing the metatarsal. Same case, but just in now in a true axial plane, we can see the marrow here of the metatarsal, nice and white on T1, nice and dark on T2 fat set. On the, at the proximal phalanx, this is no longer as white as this. So this is low, this is lower T1 signal than we want with corresponding high T2. And then this is really easy here uh, from a diagnostic standpoint, really low T1 uh, and high T2. So this is all osteomyelitis of the, the phalanges, but it's sparing the metatarsals. And this is where it's more helpful than bone scan because we can be very specific as to exactly what bones are, are involved. 
Whereas the bone scan, it might be a little hard to localize that. And then short axis is really one of my favorite uh, ways to look at things because you can look right down the axis. Here's the second digit, so you can see the marrow, you can see the black cortex. Here you see gray inside, and you see a little bit of this black cortex, but it's been disrupted. So uh, we get a very nice look uh, down the short axis. Again, the alternative, if you can't get an MRI, and you should get an MRI as your really diagnostic study of choice after you have that x-ray, okay? Uh, sometimes it's really um, easy for you guys to pull down whole body bone scan. You don't need a whole body bone scan. It's really not what you want to order, okay? You want to order a three-phase bone scan of the, the body part of interest, particularly the, fit, the foot, uh, and you want to order that in conjunction with a white blood cell scan, okay? Um, so here's your three-phase bone scan. So in your blood pool, you can see that there's hyperemia to that toe, but hyperemia could just be cellulitis, so it's not specific enough. All right, soft tissue uptake, again, could be cellulitis or it could be osteo. And then on the delayed, you see increased activity uh, there. So that's going to be consistent with osteomyelitis. But if this patient has a fracture, it's going to look like that. If this patient has severe degenerative changes right there, it's going to look like that. So the bone scan isn't going to be quite as specific. But if you can link that with the white blood cell scan and you get a positive study, you can link that location with that location. Degenerative changes are not going to be positive on a white blood cell scan. Fracture is not going to be positive on a white blood cell scan. So if you want to really get some specificity out of this, you need to do it in conjunction. So your second line test should really be your three-phase bone scan coupled with the white blood cell scan. Okay, so pretty much in summary, relevant history improves sensitivity and specificity particular, where is the ulcer, what do you, where is the thing that you're looking for uh, is very helpful. So don't forget the radiographs. MRI is a study of choice. Contrast is usually not needed. Uh, and the three-phase bone scan with the white cell scan is really the recommended alternative. Um, I mean, the system, of course, under the regular emails, by all means, don't hesitate to either uh, send me a note, uh, come to the department. Some of you do come down still regularly. I'd encourage anybody who hasn't been in the department recently, come down on one of your complicated cases. If you've got a question on how to image something, <coughs> let us know and, and we can try to help guide you that. Um, this just kind of gives you the MRI sensitivity and specificity. It's about 90% sensitive. I think it's higher on well-performed studies uh, and the specificity is about 80. And now to link into the following study, uh, we pretty much define the extent of osteomyelitis as where the T1 abnormality is. Again, the T2 signal is hypersensitive, okay? And if there is an amputation or a resection, um, and you go out about 0.5 centimeters from the edge of the T1 abnormality, you've got a pretty much 50% negative margin. So you're going to have to, if you're going to amputate, you've got to go a little bit further than that. If you have a resection margin of one centimeter beyond the T1 abnormality, um, you'll have a 91% uh, negative uh, margin. So um, at that point, you need to talk to your vascular surgeon. Okay. Dr. Kowalczyk has to leave, but before he does in a while, Dr. Diaz is setting up. Does anybody have a question for him? Yes, sir. So if you are going to have to pursue the, the three-phase bone scan with the white scan, what's the turnaround time for the series of tests? Um, that's, uh, that's a great question for Dr. Leitner. Um, but uh, the, the bone scans, I mean, we used to do 24-hour bone scans, and now we do them two or four hours. Um, the white cell scan, I, I think it takes a little bit longer, but at least you can get that. So if you have your three-phase bone scan result in a couple hours, if it's negative, you know, you're home free already. So if you have a, a triple negative, triple phase bone scan, you're, you're not going to have uh, osteo, so you'll have that answer. If it's positive, you may have to wait just a little bit longer to get the white cell scan. And you might have to wait that long to get an opening on the MRI scanner anyway. So it, it may not actually hurt you uh, from that standpoint. Any other questions? OK. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a little awkward.
<laughs> We're still connected at the hip. Uh, so I'm one of the uh, new vascular surgeons here, uh, and when Dr. Lesher asked me to give a talk, I've been here for about six weeks. He said, I said, sure, why not? <laughs> right. um, so I'm going to give a vascular surgery perspective uh, on foot infections, and obviously we know that diabetes is associated with peripheral artery disease, and that's how we get called in for all this. Uh, wounds with infections for debridements, amputations, uh, and today I hope I can make a case for limb salvage. Um, so diabetes has got a lot of these risk factors uh, that leads to atherosclerosis and eventually peripheral artery disease, uh, dyslipidemia, we all know this uh, at the tips of our tongues, right? Uh, dyslipidemia, cytokines, uh, endothelial dysfunction in diabetes, overproduction of reactive oxygen species, uh, inflammatory pathways, leukocyte recruitment, uh, apoptosis of macrophage, and smooth muscle proliferation and plaque formation. I uh, just want to say a little bit about the Rutherford classification. Uh, this is, we use this in peripheral artery disease, but because of the association with diabetes and wounds, I think it's very important to take a look at this. Um, we classified zero to six with, uh, with, with extending, with increasing severity, mild claudication category one to the minor tissue loss uh, with non-healing ulcer and focal gangrene in, gray, in uh, category five, and then the six with major tissue loss and uh, often extends above the metatarsal uh, level. And the ABI is arresting ankle pressure less than 60 and the toe pressures less than 30. So in the Rutherford 6 category, which, uh, which has a higher chance of limb loss, they also have a higher mor morbidity and mortality because they have so many other associated medical conditions. Um, may require multiple foot procedures, uncontrolled medical comorbidities, and they also may have multi-level stenosis or occlusions in the arteries, and uh, therefore may need multi-level reconstructions. This is, a, this is one of the trials, this is the Excel trial. I just want to highlight this. Uh, they did a, did a, looked at Rutherford 4, 5, and 6, and obviously uh, major death or major amputation and the percent event-free survival you can see, I mean, not surprising that Rutherford 6 will have a higher mortality, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, mortality and major amputation risk compared to the Rutherford 4 and 5, which is claudication, and 5 is minor tissue loss. The 6 is obviously the major tissue loss that we are talking about. And then there was this SVS. There is this SVS, lower extremity classification. We call it the Wi-Fi classification. A wound ischemia and foot infection. So they graded the, the wounds and the gangrene, grade 0 to 3, uh, one being the least severe, there's a small, shallow al ulcer, and then you get a deeper, deeper ulcer with exposed bone, and the grade three is more extensive with deep tissue loss, calcaneal involvement, and, and, so, and so on. And then you also have the ischemia. <clears throat> now, ABIs may sometimes be non-compressible, uh, especially if they're, I mean, if they're greater than 1.3, and so, they often they use the transcutaneous PO2 measurements to define the level of ischemia. And based on this, they, they classify this as stage one to five. Uh, so, uh, so Wi-Fi stage five is actually not, not salvageable. Uh, Wi-Fi stage four is more like the Rutherford classification, except that there is infection in the Wi-Fi staging. And Rutherford is mostly for like tissue loss from peripheral artery disease. And we have, we have these different studies uh, with Wi-Fi staging, with limb salvage. We have one, two, three, and four. Obviously, you can see with diabetic foot infections, 
uh, with PAD and everything in stage four, the amputation risks are between almost 30 to 40 percent. And as you get to the lower stages, you have a much higher limb salvage rate. This is not surprising also, it's something we just said, stage four more likely to undergo multiple open and endovascular revascularizations and non-vascular surgical interventions as well, like debridements and minor amputations, sometimes even a major amputation. This is the stage four, three, two, and one. This is, uh, just to show you a picture, this is a pretty late presentation, I would say, uh, of a rather for six category, you have infection spreading almost to the toes here, the second and third toe. Uh, I don't even think looking at this, these toes would be salvageable eventually, but you can see the infection is kind of uh, spreading distally and proximally with cellulitis. This would be the Wi-Fi stage four as well. So we have to drain infection, very aggressive debridement, multi may need multivessel revascularization if you have associated PAD, uh, may need a bypass procedure, control medical conditions, diabetes, I'm just going to show, these are some of the cases that, that I did in the last two weeks, really. Uh, look at this. Uh, this is a single vessel runoff. Uh, this is the anterior tibial artery. The posterior tibial and peroneal arteries are occluded. Uh, this was pre, and then this is post-balloon dilatation. You have like an in, uh, inline flow all the way to the dorsalis pedis artery. So his chances of saving his foot uh, just improved. This is another case, a lesion, pretty tight, I would say. Um, after a stent, unfortunately, you can't really see the stent because this is not a DS. I mean, uh, if you see the whole run, you'll be able to see, but I just took a snapshot of this. It's the, snap, the stent is somewhere around here, but there's much better flow through this vessel. And this is just off the plain old balloon angioplasty. The stent, without a stent, just with balloon angioplasty, and this is a very tough lesion. This is something that I did yesterday, actually. Um, like the popliteal involved, the distal superficial femoral artery completely occluded. Uh, and then these are very difficult lesions to stent. If you do a bypass, you have to do a baloney bypass. Uh, so uh, I think this patient uh, was best served with an atherectomy. We use a uh, atherectomy device to shave off the plaque and eventually do a balloon angioplasty, and he had a palpable pulse at the end of it. Uh, this is you know, just a picture uh, to, to depict how the angioplasty works. You have plaque built up and the, and the side, side walls of the arteries. Uh, the balloon expands and pushes the plaque towards the, towards the periphery, and you have an expanded lumen. This is just a self-expanding stent that you deploy if uh, to keep the vessel open, I mean, the principle is the same. You have a metal stent that opens up the lumen and improves the flow. We have different tools, different catheters to, to, to do this uh, endovascular without any, <clears throat> without any incision. Uh, this is a trial, in fact, trial. They, they, they tried, they compared drug-coated balloon versus plain old balloon angioplasty, but that's not the purpose I'm, I'm showing this. Uh, 358 subjects in Rutherford six category, uh, there was freedom from amputation uh, at one year, 2% in the, in the two to 4% in both groups, I would say. Uh, the plain old balloon angioplasty did a little better, surprisingly, but um, so this is without infection, obviously, but this is major tissue loss. You can still save limbs up to 96%. But if you have an infection, uh, then it, we already saw it's about 30 to 40%. And rather for six, depending on the study, it could be up to 10% amputation risk. Uh, open surgical options. Uh, this is obviously a very long bypass in X. This X low by femoral, by X low femoral, and then a femoral femoral bypass. Uh, this is just the principle of the bypass to, basically it's a, it's a tube, a vein harvest or a, or a plastic tube just to bypass that occlusion. 
in the artery. And this is uh, an angiographic picture. This is a below knee uh, bypass with a vein that is bypassing this completely occluded uh, distal SFA and popliteal artery. So most of the times we end up doing debridements to amputations uh, and then you have to go higher up because of increasing infections. Uh, you, you end up with a transmetatarsal amputation and a lot of the times the next step is a baloney amputation. But there has been some renewed interest in uh, the, uh, the other foot amputations actually. Uh, some controversy about it still, but the Liz Franks is just taking it right at the, uh, the, the tarsal, metatarsal joints. And then these are the midfoot amputations, the Chopats and the Sims. Uh, like, I, Sims, like I said, uh, there has been some renewed interest in these amputations as well. <clears throat> um, endovascular interventions have increased. That's a trend we see. Uh, bypasses. Uh, with increasing endovascular interventions, the rates of bypasses are, are trending downwards, and so also are the amputation rates. Uh, the amputation rates, bypasses, and endovascular in, uh, interventions nationally are going up uh, with decreasing amputation rates. So one of the things that I saw in the email was pearls and pitfalls, so this is what I thought I'd put together. Early intervention with diabetic foot infections, which are associated with PAD, as we know. Aggressive drainage and debridement, recognizing bone involvement. Antibiotic uh, management in a timely fashion. And what I call is limited limb-saving amputations, like a toe amputation is better than the whole foot. A trans uh, metatarsal resection is better than the whole foot. Uh, and now, a couple of toes is also better than a whole foot. Early revascularization. Um, endovascular open doesn't matter, but you know that they have, the most often they have associated PAD, so we have to revascularize uh, to get enough antibiotic or, or, or blood down there just for tissue healing. And ongoing wound care is obviously important. Pitfalls, underestimating the disease. Delay in referral to subspecialties, under, underestimating underlying bone involvement and location of tissue loss. Uh, plantar versus dorsal, obviously, the plantar is more morbid condition because it's a weight bearing surface of the foot and has a lower chance of healing as opposed to a dorsal surface of the foot. So I get this all the time, but I have a good Doppler pulse. Uh, so I don't have PAD, he doesn't have PAD. He's got a diabetic wound. I, so I don't think there's, a, there's such a thing called Doppler pulse. It's a Doppler signal. And unless you have a palpable, palpable pulse, you cannot rule out PAD even with normal ABIs because most of the time in diabetes, the vessels are calcified and the ABI can be falsely elevated. So I'll be interested in seeing your early aggressive amputation <laughs> uh, finale, but you know, two to four percent major amputation risk, 10% to, you know, with infections, 30 to 40%. Uh, I think this looks a little better than that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. Um, and I, I, we are remiss in failing to introduce Dr. Diaz. Do you want, he, as he said, he's been here only six weeks. You want to just give us a little blurb about yourself, where you came from, and <laughs> what, you were, uh, what, you were, uh, what you're what you practicing, or what you focus on, or when you would like to see patients refer to you. It sounds for like diabetes, or well, for foot ulcers, or for potential uh, candidates for revascularization. It sounds like it sounds like the ABI is not reliable. It sounds like it's a, it's a pulsing, and given that data up there, it sounds like the success rate. If you're going to do a revascularization it would be important to try to do that before you get an infection. Is that correct? Right. So um, I, can, I was in Massachusetts for the last five, six years. Before that, I was in Maine uh, for another five, six years. So I've traveled around a little bit. But I've been here for six weeks. The answer to your question, 
Um, ABI by itself uh, may not give you the whole picture, so you have to, I, I like to look at the images. If you have a, uh, you look at the arteries at various levels and see the Doppler waveforms in those arteries, look at the SFA, popliteal, tibial arteries, and see what it looks like. You look at the triphas triphasic versus a biphasic versus a monophasic waveform. It gives you a lot of information. Also, the velocities in the arteries will give you. So if you get an arterial duplex study, that gives you a lot of uh, information about that. Uh, and you have a monophasic waveform. Monophasic waveform is because there's a stenosis approximately, and you have an ABI of 1.2. I mean, more than 1.3, basically, it's falsely elevated. So if it's, if it's 1.2 or 1.1, and if it's a monophasic waveform, you have a stenosis up top, you know it's falsely elevated. So that gives a lot of information. Ob obviously, angiogram is the gold standard. So if you don't feel a pulse, sometimes I understand with infection, et cetera, uh, it, it may be hard to feel a pulse because the foot is swollen. So uh, it's difficult. Uh, but again, if you put all the information together, the duplex ultrasound, uh, I have a very low threshold for, uh, for uh, extremity angiograms with non-healing wounds, non-healing ulcers, if you don't feel a pulse. If I can feel a pulse in the office, then we'll say, all right, you have good perfusion down. Uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of wound care, and also then it depends on the location of the ulcer. Is, is it close to the bone? Is it on the plantar surface? Do we need offloading? Things like that. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Dr. Yes. Okay. <coughs> I have that. Um, yeah, that thing. Okay. We'll get... We go. Well, no, uh, no discussion of diabetic feet is complete without drawing your attention to these two guidelines. Uh, so I just want to make sure everybody's aware of the International uh, Working Group on Diabetic Foot Infection Guidelines. In that guidelines, there's at least 25 or more recommendations. Um, and that's available at the uh, link there. I'd be happy to share it with you or to make these slides available. Another important one is the ID, Infectious Disease Society guidelines as well. And I just want to extract um, a couple of do's and don'ts from one of the many tables in there. So obtain appropriate specimen, obtain a tissue, okay? We can't emphasize that point enough. Aspirate any purulent material and you can continue to read. But you know, it's very difficult to, you know, when you have a wound, an open wound as you see here, and as it was presented, and you'll see again, that's going to grow. The cultures are going to be grow. So the dilemma is, is that colonization? Is it active infection? Do your best to try to figure out up front if you think, is it looking like this? Is it, could it be infected? If it's not infected, don't culture it. Obtain a specimen. Um, don't obtain a specimen without good preparation. And um, don't use swabs. That's the big thing. So I distill this down as surface swabs are just about useless. You'll hear that, oh, there's poor correlation, but except for MRSA or Staph aureus. But if you look at the studies, even with Staph aureus, it's not much better than a coin flip. In the day of high throughput and get the patients in and get the patients out within the 4.2, you know, ideal window length of stay, it's often hard to do this next thing, but it's critically important. Stop the antibiotics. It's generally not an emergency, so you can have some time, some elective. If you can stop the antibiotics, ideally, two weeks before a bone biopsy, that's, that's what we would really love. And I know what happens. The patient comes in, you wait a couple days at most, and then you do a bone biopsy. Try to stop it at two weeks. For if you're going to do the biopsy, always try to debride an area first and go through a clean area. When amputating tissue, not swabs. If you're in the OR and you're going to send a sample, there's so much more uh, valuable. And we had a meeting recently with vascular surgery, Dr. Geary, Dr. Diaz. One thing that is critically helpful to help uh, infectious disease give you a better consult and a better product is when you're taking off the amputation, you take off, you take off your amputated digit. But in addition to that, send a proximal uh, sample of the proximal margin. That can help determine the length of, of therapy. 
And as we saw in the radiology, now you know you can look at the MRI and you can have some estimate. If you take your margin, uh, an, a centimeter from, from the, the, the T1 limit, you have a 91% chance of having clean bone. That could make a difference between a week or two of antibiotics versus six weeks of IV antibiotics. And when we're talking about antibiotics, more is not necessarily better. Longer is not better. I would argue that antibiotics play one of the most minor roles here. As was alluded to, wound care is critical. Diabetes management is critical. Offloading, all of these are far more important than uh, antibiotic. From Brad Spellberg, antibiotic mantra, shorter is better. And that's a table where, uh, using the references there, uh, shorter antibiotic has been proven uh, the same or equivalent to longer antibiotic days. And so what we use to usually to determine the duration, the recommended duration, if there's residual infected bone, hence the importance of getting those two specimens, the proximal margin, and, the via, and it's viable, that's where we get generally the six weeks of antibiotics. If for some reason you can't debride all the bone and there's necrotic bone left, nobody knows what the duration should be. Some people say 10 to 12 weeks, who knows? But if you have clean margins, but, and you have a lot of surrounding cellulitis or nasty, you know, you know soft tissue infection, you can, I kind of consider that acute contiguous osteomyelitis get by with not much more than two weeks, maybe even less. So six weeks of IV antibiotics is passe, right? Where did we get that from? One study in 1970s by Volvogel, New England Journal of Medicine. Since that time, there's not been many good comparative studies. In 2013, there was a meta-analysis of about 300 patients, eight randomized controlled trial, and they concluded that IV has no advantage over oral. You could find that in the Cochrane database. I think that was one of the things that, that triggered or promoted the OVIVA trial, so oral versus IV antibiotics. Recently published, 2019, this was a pragmatic non-inferiority trial. It was intentionally inclusive, so it didn't matter if you had this pathogen or that pathogen or where it was, or the antibiotic regimen. Fully 60% of the patients in that study also had existing hardware. And how it was done was that at the beginning of the study, you, the, the, usually the antibiotic choices were selected by specialists. Uh, and you, with no later than seven days of the start, so if the person had surgery, within seven days, they, were, they got, the, they got the, the, the group. They got oral antibiotics or IV. The outcome was treatment failure at one year. And they concluded that rates of treatment failure were the same, not inferior but early discontinuation was more likely in the IV. And ultimately, uh, initial oral treatment right from the start was not inferior uh, to in intravenous. And then you might ask, what are the best, if I'm gonna use some orals, what are the best uh, choices to penetrate the bone? And you know, I paraphrase basically, this is a fairly thick article and it's pretty, it, it's pretty uh, you know, data dense and PKPD dense. And basically, though, the authors themselves say, basically, your guess is as good as ours. Their conclusion was that there's substantial variability in the reported mean bone penetration, you know, between, you know, different, um, between drugs, between different studies of the same drug. So it kind of depends. But overall, what they could com conclude with is that the quinolones, and you could see there, have decent or good bone penetration, less so for the cephalosporins and uh, the penicillins. Here's a study from our local center. Dr. Valyesulieva was present, this presented a study, and this is how well do antibiotics that we choose, how well do they stay effectiveness, or how concordant are they after the patient goes home? Because I mentioned that quick throughput, right? Patients are in, get the biopsy, get the amputation. What's the recommendation we want to discharge? Oftentimes, we're consulted the day of, the day of discharge. So adult patients that had a bone biopsy, discharged before the final cultures were available, uh, and uh, that happens a little bit in a minor, in a majority of the cases, uh, a slight majority of the cases. Most of the infections there are polymicrobial. You can read the list of pathogens there. Um, many gram stains that were negative eventually ended up having growth. So you can't be reassured by the initial uh, a negative gram stain. And look at this, agreement between uh, on discharge and the final culture, 
uh, discordant the majority of times. And I'm guilty of this. I've been burned a lot. Now, hopefully this is going to be better now that we have our PA. We have uh, PA McKenzie working in the OPAT department. She has, this allows us closer follow-up, and it allows us to identify these a little quicker before they fall through the cracks. But keep that in mind. Uh, I would say a significant amount of time, your patient's going to be discharged before you get the final culture, especially the anaerobe culture. It can take five up to five days. So don't forget to check it. And that's, that's basically w what I just said. Okay, so these, this recently was easily found quick the last week or two of the patients that we've seen. And we were consulted for the question is long-term antibiotics. So rather than early amputation, and I'm glad Dr. Diaz set it up that way because we like a, a little debate back and forth. He makes a good, decent argument for, for revascularization. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the other approach initially. So here's another patient, right, that did get... Uh, two rounds of six weeks of antibiotic for this kind of heel ulcer. And this image over here is about this, is the same ulcer a month later. So I ask you, is that, is that getting better? Is that stable? Is it getting worse? I don't know. Okay, so but let's take a step back and look at the actual pathophysiology or the pathogenesis of a diabetic, of a foot ulcer. You got autonomic motor and sensory neuropathy causing the callus formation. Underneath the callus formation, you get a hemorrhage. Underneath, after that, then somebody either removes that callus or the, sometimes the callus is traumatized and is removed. Ultimately, that becomes colonized. How, you know, where is there not bacteria? So that ulcer is going to get colonized. But where in, that, in the upper stages of that do you see that antibiotic could have any impact? Okay, and if you look at the recurrence rates uh, after ulcer healing, 40% at one year, up to 65%, this is after healing, 65% um, of ulcers will recur at five years. Here's the case, another case for, uh, you know, maybe earlier amputation. If you look at the top seven, these are risk factors that were independently associated with ulcer recurrence. You got vibration, you got the presence of a pre-ulcerative lesion, artery, peripheral artery disease, uh, presence of an ulcer on the plantar foot, as Dr. Diaz mentioned, they're worse than on the top, um, and, and the presence of, uh, of osteomyelitis. Of those, only, only the first top six are modifiable, are relatively modifiable by, um, by antibiotics, or not modifiable, I should say. Here is the overall effect size of the five categories of uh, studies that are intervention, the most interventions that are most likely associated to reduce the risk of recurrence. And you can see that the percent or the mean effect size is not that great. For foot surgery, you have 61%. And what the mean effect size is, 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 is means is that that's the percentage reduction in the risk of recurrent foot. So you almost get no reduction until you get to actual foot surgery for that. So I, I, I was going to put a cost comparison in here, and I was going to say, how much does it cost to do, uh, insert a pick line? How much does it cost for six weeks of vancomycin, for vancomycin levels, and then for repeated debridements? And if you try to get the cost effect, interestingly enough, these costs, it's, there's at least a week turnaround time from our billing department. You may know that uh, there's a recent law passed that's this healthcare comparison law where hospitals have to make available prices for a procedure to their patients. And I guess they're so backed up, but when we asked, we still haven't heard back how much. So I can't give you the actual uh, cost head-to-head -head comparison. But I would argue that, you know, you have a big bulky dressing. Many of the patients are not ambulatory anyway. Um, you know, I would question that if, you, if, if amputation was a little bit more widespread, and practice more aggressively for unsalvageable things, you know, that would send a message to patients. And that could, in turn, make them more compliant with their diabetes regimen. One of the big biases I have, and then we'll get to the end, and I'm, I'm coming at you from, a, uh, obviously, a biased approach here, is our, our, what we all feel, you know, the ID Society, World Health Organization, the CDC. What is one of the biggest threats, if not the biggest threat? It's growing antimicrobial resistance crisis. You, you have an, a, you know, recurrent rounds of six weeks of antibiotics, broad-spectrum antibiotics. Do nothing to help that. And so one of the paradigms where, where, where Dr. Hinkle and I recently came from was limb salvage, limb preservation at all costs. This was from the, the wounded service uh, members you know, in, the, in the ongoing conflicts. 
And there was, at that point, you could see there was no, no amount of damage that was not attempted to salvage, right? And I get it. You, the, more, the more surface area you have or the more, um, the more extremity you have, that has big impacts for rehabilitation potential. But you can see that in that. How many trips is that patient going to go back and forth for a washout? Every third day, they're going back to the OR for a washout. They're getting more and more procedures. What does that do? That increases the chance of spreading highly resistant bacteria. And Walter Reed, where we came from, we almost had to shut the hospital down because of the, of the, the became endemic in the hospital. Multi-drug, pan-drug resistant organisms. I would also argue then for amputation in the advanced prosthetics that we have. Many of you have heard about the DARPA arm. This is a prosthetic that's supposed to sense yeah, the intention. It's an intention-driven prosthetic that actually exists. And it also provides feedback, and it's also supposed to be giving them an element of, of sensation. Finally, I would say, you know, if, you know, it has to happen, if or when it happens, it's not the end of the world. And you can, you can find, easily find thousands of success stories with these and less advanced prosthetics of, you know, it's not the end. And many patients are very nervous. They're, you know, not to sound insensitive, but um, they're, they're, they're very scared of amputation. And I think when the decision to amputate, when it's, when it's unavoidable, I think it behooves all of us to try to reassure them with stories like this. This was also a personal story. This is, uh, does anybody know this person? This was a patient of ours at Walter Reed. Uh, she was a, a helicopter pilot, shot down, um, lost two of her legs and also almost her arm to multi-drug, you know, all those infections. Uh, but now, you know, here's another success story. This is Senator Duckworth of, uh, of Illinois, and she's a great advocate for a lot of health care uh, issues for us. So with that, I hope that I kind of not convinced you, that I, but rather opened up your mind a little bit that amputation is not, is not the, you know, the, the, it's the scariest thing, and that there are benefits. There is life, as you can see, after amputation. So with that, we'll uh, have five or so minutes of questions. Uh, well, I, you know, I, um, that's a great question. That's a great question. No, I, I, you know, obviously, I guess it would depend on your insurance insurance coverage, but uh, the, yeah, not everybody, right? But even even you know even the, I mean, you have that, or even even the ones that aren't so advanced are still not that bad. They're still pretty effective, ma'am. I'll let, um, I'll let Dr. Diaz. So the report is, I hope that the rest of the report will give some insight into, um, i just hold this, no, sure. <laughs> uh, into uh, what to do next. If they say that, that ABI is uh, falsely elevated, I would see the rest of the report. I, I understand in, in, in the primary care practice it will be very difficult. It might be difficult, but if it says uh, no stenosis noted uh, in both lower extremities or something like that, it will give, give you an impression that, all right, ABI is elevated because it's calcified, but at the same time, they don't find any significant stenosis. So, uh, but I would say when in doubt, just get an early only referral. In evaluating these folks from the primary care uh, perspective, would, would you suggest sequencing the referrals? Would you say go to vascular first and then wound care next, or just send to wound care and let them decide where else, if any, vascular is wrong? Excellent question. Uh, so if you feel palpable pulses, I would say sometimes uh, the infection is not, uh, has, doesn't have that much swelling and you may be able to feel the pulses. If you have a good pulse, either a DP or PT, any one of them is good. You don't have to have both. But if you have a palpable pulse, either a DP or PT, I, I probably wound care is the way to go. Uh, 
and then if the wound continues to not heal, uh, then they can, they can initiate a vascular referral. But if you don't feel pulses right off the bat, uh, then I think a referral to both might be appropriate. Can, the wound care people can take care of the wound and ongoing follow-up and monitor the progress, et cetera, but we can take care of the, of the perfusion to enhance wound healing and, and prevent an amputation in the future. Actually, a, a great question again. So if we do a bypass, we have, uh, our vascular lab has a protocol set up to automatically bring them in uh, for what we call as graft surveillance. Uh, we'll do a three month and then six months and then a year and if the graft is, uh, is, is, uh, shows any signs of intimal hyper, hyperplasia, stenosis will intervene and uh, increase the patency rates of the grafts. So, but with endovascular interventions, yeah, we'll, 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 we don't have that type of, I mean, that's not, we don't have that sort of a protocol because it's, it's all endovascular. But again, it also depends on the symptoms of the patient. If it feels fine, we may do a six month follow up, sometimes a yearly follow up. But if there's any, any change in his symptoms or a wound develops or something like that, then they're advised to call us right away. There, there was a question in the back, and then we'll get to the front one. Eric? Um, what type of anticoagulation is preferred after a Um, Yeah, so there's a lot of, uh, there's some mixed data about that. Uh, with stents, uh, I mean, I usually do both a dual antiplatelet therapy, although uh, there's some recent suggestion that you don't really need Plavix, and if you do, you need it for a short period of time, like a month, uh, maximum three months or so. But sometimes uh, you see that, so, so for a stent to be patent, you need a good inflow and a good outflow. And sometimes we see this in diabetics, the tibial disease is, is very extensive. Um, you know, there's no good outflow, so the stent is at a risk to, to occlude. Uh, if you see, if you have a good inflow and good outflow, before and after the inflow means the, the flow coming into the stent and outflows outside of the uh, distal to the stent, then much higher chances of stent patency and you probably don't need dual antiplatelet therapy, but at least aspirin, I would say. But you know, some, some of these people are real vasculopaths and you're always worried that with poor distal outflow, uh, the stent may occlude, so you keep them on Plavix. The question was, if the patient had no bacteremia and an amputation, is there any role for prolonged antibiotics? I, I would say no. 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 I would, you know, if there was residual, a uh, fair amount of residual soft tissue infection remaining, but generally that's not the case, but if there is, you can use a short trial, but no. Uh, that you mean you have, that's the best source control. You have just controlled all the source. Can you, can you guys hear? I'm sorry, I'll stop talking. But if you get everything kind of tied up, squared away for IV antibiotics, and then you don't see what happens downstream. Um, and so, sorry, it's just talking right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> what is this thing? Um, so just just kind of the uh, the kind of social and financial things that have that have come up for a, a lot of my patients um, in terms of you know like the the cost of things like you know, tubing, flushes, those kind of things that actually are not covered by their insurance, it becomes a big problem. Um, I've actually had patients that are just so um, nauseated, distressed on their IV antibiotics, some that have actually gone through chemotherapy before and have flat out told me I'd rather go through chemo again than get my IV antibiotics. Um, and then there's the, the, the things like complications with the PICC lines, um, needing recurrent doses of cath flow, again, most of the times not covered by their insurance. So there's a lot of things that, that go into, you know, those last two to four weeks of IV antibiotics that we don't necessarily see on the inpatient side. So a lot of times, um, especially when the residents ask me, well, how are you deciding between oral and IV antibiotics? I think 
the social um, aspects of, of your patient are actually very important to, to factor in. And a similar comment um, is that, um, I, I can, I'm loud. <laughs> That's a great. That's a great point, and I'm sure they, it's basic. But um, when I was in primary care, I made this mistake a couple times. You make it once or twice, but you won't make it again. Every visit that your patient comes in, you got to have them take their socks and shoes off, you know. Um, but I, you know, how you doing, Joe? Great, great. A month goes by, revisit, looking at you're just worried about the glucose. How's it doing, Joe? How's it doing, Joe? Finally, we say, hey, let's take a look at your feet, and there's a big hole in his foot, and it looks like that. You know, um, we didn't talk about all the basics, about the Pettis criteria and about all of that, and about the temperature measurements of various foot and the sensitivity testing, but that's critical to prevent for prevention. Um, did you have a question? Yeah. Is the imaging for the MRI is more or less convincing for an uh, imaging of the inflammation or infection and osteomyelitis, but you do a biopsy, and let's say it shows the structure, but there's no um, culture possibility because another indication got some antibiotic for whatever reasons. How do, how do you then decide it? Do you believe the yep. own cultures are right. going to then? That's a great question, and I should have pointed it out. So um, ideally, I should have mentioned that when you collect the samples, not just the bone culture, we really, we really try to encourage them to send histopathology as well. And so then you have, the goal, if the culture is negative, as it often is, at least you can fall back on the, you know, the pathologic uh, you know, interpretation. And if it says no inflammation, no osteomyelitis, then we're pretty confident that we can just get by with, with a soft tissue infection. Do you guys, do you guys agree? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, that's a great point, and that happens a lot. Um, and it happens a lot with vertebral osteomyelitis, too. And I try to get the team to go back and do another biopsy, but in interventional, it are often not. Uh, you know, you have sampling error or you have other things, but it's, it's the dilemma. That's why, you know, a big sample sent for culture and pathology is critical. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.